And now it's time for our special guest. All right, joining us today, oh, that's Morgan Randberg. <laughs> joining us today is Tom Bridgman from NASA. Morgan special. Tom, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thank you for having me. There we go, now the camera switched. Uh, so for people who don't know who you are, let us know who you are and what you do. Uh, well, I work as, I'm a contractor at uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in the Scientific Visualization Studio at NASA Goddard. Um, we, we are, we are, we are the, you know, some, there's other groups around NASA that do this, but we're one of the, the larger ones. We um, take data from satellites, sometimes looking at Earth, Moon, Mars, and other areas, the sun in particular for my specialty, uh, and assemble these in, in context to provide visualizations that the general public can, you know, sort of get a better grasp of the science. Um, you know, some of our stuff may be as simple as just, you know, in, in some cases when the sun is active, you know, you just put up an SDO image and it takes over the NASA feed sometimes. But uh, very often we have more complex stories in Helio. We do stuff, magnetospheric stories and stuff like that, which are much more complex and require, you know, you just don't want to show <clears throat> the joke about the squiggly line that scientists like. Um, you want to be able to show something in the context of, of where the spacecraft is taking the measurement and, and whatnot. So. Yeah, and I think almost everybody who's watching this show, listening to the podcast, is going to be familiar with your work or the work from the rest of the people on your team. And I think one of the ones that was just amazing was the the swirly lines of the ocean that look like this abstract mm -hmm. painting. Yes. And and that's real data. Yes. Well, it's it's data. It's it. My understanding is that one is actually from a, a, an ocean circulation model, but it is seeded with real data and updated with real data. And we have a number of those that run, and we can generate them at very high resolution to yeah. to build visuals like that. Yeah, and they're just—I mean—they're just absolutely stunning. Uh, ones that I've relied on in the past quite a bit is like the visualizations of the moon, sort of going through mm -hmm. an entire year's worth of its yes. of its. You know, you can see its libration, and you can see the you know it ru running through. You know, it sort of comes closer and and further, and you can see how it kind of almost like rocks back and forth. You can see the shadows changing on the. Yes. Uh, it's just amazing. And now you specifically are in you know you work on the uh the stuff that has to do with the sun right uh largely the sun or the, uh, my, my joke is that it's any plasma above the ionosphere is is essentially my domain um and actually the ionosphere too since nasa has a couple of missions coming up we've uh gold and launched recently and icon is supposed to launch uh, hopefully soon and um, so I've been doing a lot of stuff with ionospheric physics, which is actually quite fascinating. And I think that's a really fascinating uh, way to approach this is that all of these satellites are dumping out all of this data, mountains and mountains and mountains of data. And obviously scientists are looking for specific things to answer specific questions, but there mm -hmm. is an art component to what is being generated as well and a way to kind of synthesize and see it when you kind of stand back and be able to just to see all this data going on yeah. in front. So, so what are some examples of some projects that you've turned into these visualizations in the past? Uh, well, I don't know. Since I have a science background, I, you know, I got a PhD in astrophysics uh, and was doing uh, research on GRO, actually, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory before budget situations sent me this way. And it turned out I had a, I had played with computer graphics rendering when I was in grad school a little bit. Uh, and this was back in the 90s, so it was really primitive renderers. But um, I'd always had this sense of, you know, you'd want to be able to show stuff together and, and, and in some kind of context. And that's one of the, the main things that we do. This is one of the things that distinguishes what we call data visualization from other types of visualization. You want to be able to bring the data together and, and actually show it in some way that makes it more clear what you're actually seeing. Um, <clears throat> the um, there's a lot of stuff that I've done that I regard as very, very straightforward. You know, I've, there's a, some stuff that that we I was involved with just with a recent release about a, a new type of magnetic reconnection, where I have the MMS the four MMS spacecraft flying along, and then I trail their measurements out along their track. 
Uh, that one was actually just released, so I, I um, so it would probably I, be. Uh, I know the story. I uh, okay. We, yeah, I'm 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 gonna get that going for the uh, for the audience in a second because I know exactly okay. what you're talking about. It's a okay. really trippy looking video as you're sort of seeing these magnetic reconnections. Uh, it's yeah. like, uh, I don't know, it's like something out of the 60s. It's quite a, it's, it's quite a visual. <laughs> well, there's some stuff that is done that is done with more conceptual animation, but my particular contribution on that piece was the spacecraft flying along with the data. They're, they're actual measured data. You go and you have to pull the data in, and each time you say, update the spacecraft position to here, put a data point here, make a little vector and stuff like that, and you have to tell the, the, the rendering tools to do this. And... Um, so it, it's it's really quite challenging in a lot of cases figuring out good ways to really present some of this data. Um, you know, sometimes we, you're lucky and you got images like SDO and stuff like that, but um, data like this is is has a, a challenge all its own, and uh, you have to re so really be imaginative a... and some. Hmm? Hello. Well, go ahead. Finish up. Um, yeah, it's it's just a, a a challenge sometimes to to figure out how to present the stuff in a way that help hopefully makes it more clear. Um, the um, anyway, but yeah, yeah. I was just wondering. Sorry to jump in there. No, it's okay. Given the incredible amount of data that all of these missions are are putting out, how do you choose what to you know, invest the time in making a great visualization for, because mm -hmm. surely you must have an endless number of opportunities and you've got to narrow it down to just what you can actually do. Right. Well, we do have a whole system of, you know, we have a group of producers and people that, that, you know, look for stories that, they, you know, most of the stuff we do is related to something that was funded by NASA. And so as a result, there's a group, a group that we check out stories we the um, you know what science papers are coming out that are related to a nasa mission or something like that and they'll they'll we'll go over them we'll um sometimes i'm part of the uh, contributor of you know gee is you know here's a story that and it sounds like it uses something that i'm a little bit familiar with the data and i might be able to produce something and if it's something that we think we can get done in the in the time that we have before the paper is actually released it might be something that that we pursue um, we have a number of projects where we have sort of standard pipelines for stuff. A lot of SDO data is like, you know, someone says, oh, there's a big solar flare. Can we get the, you know, the five hours up prior and the six hours after or something like that? Um, and we got stuff that will go and pull the data from the archive, you know, process it up to, up to the, the higher quality stuff that's co-registered and everything and then slap color tables on it and and be able to get it out in a fairly short time although we have had some challenges when the um if there's some flare that starts erupting and it keeps erupting <laughs> and it's sort of like well when do we stop <laughs> <laughs> yeah well like, so there's we, these we've big... had cases where oh okay I, I picked up another hour well it's still going you need another hour <laughs> right you know we have we have things like that happen well and you get those yeah, coronal some stuff, holes some of the stuff right? we can very streamline yeah, you get yeah. those those big coronal holes that that show up on the yeah. sun and kind of rotate into yeah. view, and at any point they're going to send some material our way, and yeah, and, yeah, uh, make a nice aurora. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so have you know? I think one of the things that we really saw with say the Juno spacecraft, where they weren't even originally planning to put some kind of camera system yes. on the Juno spacecraft and wiser heads prevailed and they they put what is actually a fairly low capability instrument on board Juno but the images and the work that the citizen scientists and NASA have been able to produce is just is just stunning has some of the you know the visualization work that you're doing has that sort of made its way back to the people who are designing the missions to say you know, let's have a thought about how we're going to be able to prepare and present this this information. Do you think there's, you know, a bigger role to play for that? We have to had some input on on some of this type of stuff. I mean, every time a new mission is in planning, we always sit down and say, okay, well, what kind of data is it going to be collecting? What kind of presentations can we do? Very often, I will um, for a, an upcoming mission, we'll assemble what we call a pre-launch package, and very often that's a case of. We take um, what's the best data we have at present and find some way to present to say, but we're hoping to get this better stuff. 
um, before SDO launched, we had SOHO and Trace were the two big missions that were looking at the sun. And I did a set of stuff where Trace had about the resolution of SDO, but only on a very small field of view. Whereas SOHO was getting a full field of view, but at about one third or one fourth the resolution or so. And so I did a lot of pieces where I brought together SOHO data contemporaneous with trace data and would show them side to side showing how the resolution compared between SOHO and trace and saying, this, this is what we're expecting for the entire sun every 12 seconds, a bunch <laughs> of different wavelengths and stuff like that. And, and, yeah. you know, and you put that stuff together and it also gives you a certain amount of prep uh, to, to handle the data when it eventually appears, you know, in a, in a byte stream. I've got a question here from Arjone in the chat, which is, uh, what software do you use for the visualization? So how are you actually constructing these things? Okay. Well, uh, we have a very unusual situation where on one end, we're working with the science codes. Very often I'll work with the, the solar, the software that was written in a language called IDL that the solar physicists have written to pull down their data, to, to properly co-register it, to do certain types of, of screenings and stuff like that. And then <clears throat> from there, we wanna do a quality render. We might wanna do something like a camera move to show something up close. Um, and so very often there, we, br we bring the imagery and we'll bring it into a package. We actually use tools like um, Maya and RenderMan RenderMan is the actual rendering engine. Ma Maya we use for the modeling. I'm kind of an oddball in that regard because I had more of a science background and I ran into certain problems trying to get Maya to do the kinds of computations I needed. And so I've actually got a Python thing that talks to RenderMan oh, and pull the stuff down and, and do a lot of the processing, synchronize up data sets, and then send them out to these files that are basically instructions to the rendering program saying put an image here put a surface you know put an image on a surface at this location put another image on a surface at this location and brings them together in a, a, a digital camera essentially and generates an image and we just launch a bunch of these and and over you know we have a render farm with about 80 nodes on it uh that we all have to share um and you know, it, it, take, it takes a while to generate some, some, some things generate like lickety split. Some things, um, you know, take minutes to render for an individual frame, but work gets done. I'd love it's to know what kinds of Parker missions work. you're really looking forward to. I mean, <clears throat> I think next up is like the Parker solar probe. Are you going to be mm -hmm. working with data from that? Yeah, hopefully <laughs> it's going to launch. It'll be safe. It's everything's going to work perfectly. And in a couple of years, we're yeah. going to get mountains of data closer to the sun than, than ever yeah. before, right? Yeah, I think Promise. that I, I believe there is one imager on it. Um, some of the other data is going to have some particular challenges for for that. That's going to be the squiggly the, the joke about the squiggly lines that scientists like. Yeah, but um, and that and yeah. and this leads on to a question that I got from from Nancy Graziano. What's the most challenging set of raw data that you've had to work with with respect to creating a satisfying visualization? Because <sighs> you know what one scientist's art is not necessarily <laughs> yeah. accessible to the yeah. public. Yeah. yeah. Well, hmm. I would definitely have to say that MMS has been one of the most challenging ones because it has such a high data sampling rate. Uh, this last one that I released, I actually, I, I, when I, when I first started looking at the story and I, and I looked at the data set, I was telling them, well, the last time I did a story on MMS, I did it to this time resolution and it kind of worked. But we actually run into problems where the precision of the rendering software starts to be challenged. I mean, most computer graphics renders are single precision floating point numbers. And if you're moving in on something really close and tight, sometimes that little extra digit in the, la the extra place in the last digit of a floating point number sometimes shakes and it creates little problems. I actually managed to push my, uh, my MMS um, pipeline that I had made for a previous animation got it down to in into the 100th of a second so the the one the full animation that you have you go from a wide view of the MMS orbit around the earth and I push in to where you see the four spacecraft and then I'm trailing data now taking time samples each frame is like um well I got one that's at 100th of a second I got another one that's at 15 hundredths of a second 
Wow. And I kind of pushed the limits of what I could do. I was actually pleased that everything worked, but there were a few interesting challenges along the way. Uh, but yeah, that, that kind of data is just really difficult to deal with. But it's it, it's it's fun. You have to really learn, sit, pay attention to the math and make all the pieces of software talk to each other. Uh, Johnny Zed is asking, what kind of fine arts people do you have on your crew? I mean, you're more of a scientist programmer but I mean, there's yeah. so much kind of artistic expression that's going on in a lot of these videos. So there must be mm -hmm. artists on the team. Uh, yeah, we do have a few people with more of an art background uh, and computer science background, uh, mostly computer graphics background. Um, in some of my stuff, I, I'm inclined to say that, yeah, if, if, if it's artsy, you know, I was really lucky. If it looks artistic, I'm sort of like, yeah, I, I, I was just trying to present it in some really cool way. Uh, and, and the fact that it looked good, really good, too, is, is, is a bonus. Um, but, yeah, we do have a number. Of, and we have a, a staff meeting where, you know, um, we sit out and we very often show our stuff. You know, this is where we're at on, in this project and critique it, ask, uh, ask for feedback. Uh, sometimes, you know, my joke is it's, it's become like the night of the long knives. You go out there and you, you show something, you put your heart in, you say, it's not, I don't think it's quite done yet, but I'm curious for feedback. And they go, well, you got to fix that. You got to fix it. But, you know, and it's, you just, you just get, it. you know, um, if you want to be too, if you want to be too in love with it at this point, you, you, you really are going to be disappointed because we're, we're, for some of our roughest critics and one of the things i mean i've got to say and i'm I, i'm assuming my co-hosts agree with me on this one which is that we're so fortunate to be working in a field to be reporting on a field that has access to all these visualizations i mean we do and that nasa and a lot of the other space agencies as well but especially nasa releases this material out into the public public domain feel free to enhance your own project with it. And, you know, yes. the, the videos that I do now, I'm able to go pretty much full screen video the entire time, just showing renderings of the moon and magnetic reconnections and all this kind of stuff. Big thanks to, thanks to you. I mean, are you folks aware of sort of the impact that, that making that material all freely available has to sort of the education and outreach community? We we are very aware of that, yeah. and we we occasionally uh, do lots of projects with with that group, um, and sometimes we'll do stuff where like if say I've got a new project um, that I I know that I'm going to have to do a lot of testing for for to to look at some new data set, I look at other things that I can use for sort of exercising that rendering capability. If I've got something like, you know, I've started doing a lot of stuff with particles lately. And so I wrote a little particle code that does, you know, gyro motion and stuff like that. Uh, and we wanted to do some more complicated stuff with the radiation belts. And so I was able to put together a little set of videos that have like, oh, what is gyro motion in two dimensions? You know, the part charged particle moving in the field. What is gyro motion in three dimensions? The charged particle goes and spirals up. Uh, I did things like a E cross B drift and stuff like that and put a little, bunch of little visuals out there as a test of, you know, how I had this capability. Um, and we do that so educators can hopefully make use of it. Um, you know, we, we've had some, some, a lot of, great feedback on a lot of this stuff. We've been contacted by educators. There's various things where we've done projects specifically for educational audiences. Um, and yeah, we're very aware of it and we try to please that audience as, as best we can. Yeah, it, uh, it makes my job like possible. <laughs> yes. but, you know, we were actually making a joke a couple of weeks ago about the poor people who write stories on dinosaurs. <laughs> you know, because, you know, uh, there's no pictures really, you know, there's yeah. you're gonna a couple of pictures of fossils and that's it. You know, it's not like there's teams yeah. making these wonderful paintings and three dimensional, you know, animations of dinosaurs all the time. So, uh, yeah. so, so Tom, where, if people want to get into this field, where would you recommend they, you know, if they want to putter around and tinker, where would you recommend that they, yeah. they, what skills, what you know, because all that, all, I mean, again, the, all this data is out there. A lot of the data that you're mm -hmm. dealing with is actually yes. publicly available data, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, very often it becomes, it's either publicly available right before, I mean, stuff like that, like SDO is, you know, it's just 
pumping those images out. And so very often, if we want to do something special with it, we, you know, before anyone else gets hold of it, we, we, we have to, to sort of grab it quickly. Um, but yeah, in terms of, of playing with the data, um, my own background, when I started first started playing with a computer graphics render was still pretty primitive in the, in the 90s when I first started playing with it. Um, and so the issue was l learning how to use some of the tools. Um, I know there are other people that are doing a lot of astrophysics visualization using Blender, which I've tried playing with, but I've never been able to quite wrap my mind around just how to use it. Um, I, I've had, you know, a few little simple things that, that work. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, what do I want to do next? Um, but Blender's so, free, yeah, which mean, is nice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the, the issue you run into with theirs for, cause I did some work with Maya and prior to that, we did Lightwave 3D. Um, the modeling software very often has a certain internal model of how, how the universe works. And one of the things you run into that, or that I ran into is that with a scientific background going into this stuff is that they use sort of non-physical terms to represent physical things. And, it, and you have to sort of map your brain. Like one renderer we work with used transparency instead of opacity. It was basically you know, the opposite of it. Um, but, you know, so you have to pay attention to like the mathematics of it a great deal. So the um you know if you want to be able to accurately represent the data you, you have to you know pay attention to the math the data a lot of the data one of the challenges a person will run into um just getting data off the sites is they're often in very special formats uh fits is oh. you know there's lots of readers for that uh python there's the whole astropy library that has fits readers that can pull stuff out you can put data on that um you know co or color tables on that some of the stuff, it's uh, a little bit more challenging. Um, I've had some software packages that they don't want to play on the same machine together. Um, right. But yeah, so that, so there's the science, the scientist tools that help you pull the data out into a form from what the scientist stored it in to something that you can actually use and put into a render. And that's actually a large part of our job is pulling the data out of one format and into something that the rendering program can use. You might want to say like turn an orbit trajectory into a curve in, in some software. And uh, very often you'll get like, you get like loads of different ways to get orbital ephemeris. You know, you might get like se um, the seven line elements or, se uh, or the two line orbital elements, um, the, uh, the Keplerian elements, if they have a mission that hasn't launched yet. You know, if you if you're if you're really into it, you can you do spice kernels, which is really elaborate. <laughs> you're going into the detail. Although I've wow. I've gone over to spice kernels almost exclusively for a lot of my stuff. So yeah, there, it depends on what kind of data you want. If you just want to show off one data set, that's fairly straightforward, especially if you're familiar with the data. Yeah. Um, but if there's things you want to show it in context with other stuff, that gets a lot more complicated. Um, coordinate systems become a real challenge. And that was one of the things I had problems with using the regular modeling tools is that when you're near the earth, they've got like about five different coordinate systems that are used to, to represent the data. There's one that's, it's tied to, you know, just inertial space. There's one that's tied to the earth's rotation. There's one that's tied to the earth's rotation, but at the axis, the axis is the magnetic pole, you know, and they, and they have all these weird time varying relationships and those can get really complicated to get into. Uh, that was one of the biggest challenges that I faced when I first started doing huh. the, the near earth environment was trying to, to, to find a way to represent that and tell a computer graphics program, Hey, the earth's got to be turned in this position at this particular time at this particular location. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of those things that you, you can start playing with. If you find one, if, if say you've got some data that you really want to do something with, find something simple that you start with to learn how to use the data and, a, and, a, and the tool that you're working with and build from there. I mean, a large part of um, our group uh, is advantage is we built this huge infrastructure over the years, the flows that you talked about of the, um, of the ocean flow. That started as a very simple project that was in two dimensions. That flow code now is actually behind a lot of stuff that we do. And, um, you know, we'll have like that. We'll use it for like representing the solar wind, the particle flow by the planets. Uh, there's the dynamic earth uh, dome show that has a big piece of the solar wind. that's actually built from a space weather model. 
We actually, you mm -hmm. know, pulled the model in, got the velocity field, dumped a bunch of particles in it, and then let the vector field carry those particles out past the Earth and, and uh, put in an Earth magnetosphere model in there and had the particles flow by that. But yeah, but it's something you gotta, you know, get familiar with your data, make sure you understand it well, you, and, and do something with, you know, find a small project that you can start with right. to really get your feet wet. Right, that and, sounds uh, great. Uh, Tom, yeah. well, we, we gotta wrap things up, um, but again, thank you so much for, for joining us today and, and thank, please thank everyone on your team from yes. all of us science communicators, You're how, heroes. You, you, how much we rely on the material that, that you folks are creating. It is an absolute joy to both sort of see it as a, you know, as a science nerd, but also to be able to <laughs> use this to try and get across the concepts that we're trying to explain. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. So uh, where can oh. people go to find out more about what you guys are doing? Okay, well, we're at SVS, that's Scientific Visualization Studio, dot GSFC, Goddard Space Flight Center, dot NASA, dot gov. And, um, you know, we do also kind of keep track of, if you look on some of our animations, we have like a, um, an air, air, air check thing. If some of our stuff appears in some other location, we will very often put a link to it. So we love hearing about where our stuff gets used. And if it because it, because it's useful for saying, telling people, you know, this is what we do, and other people had plenty of use for it. So you know, all right, help well, keep help keep that pipeline flowing. All right, I'll I'll let you know every time we you incorporate it into one of our our videos. That's awesome. All right, well, thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's get on to the show part. All right, here we go. It's on me. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, May 9th, 2018. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about commercial crew facing more delays, the accuracy of hurricane models, insight on its way to Mars, the case against dark matter, and Jupiter and Venus messing with Earth's orbit. Joining me this week, we've got Dr. Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Hey, Fraser. We've got Dr. Paul Sutter. Paul. It's me. And we've got Dr. Kim Cartier back after a two-week hiatus. Hey, Fraser. Happy podcast day. Nice. People were... Happy podcast day, Kimberly. We... Thanks, Paul. Morgan, uh, you know, kept that... Uh... I carried the torch. Yeah, for the, for the couple Someone's weeks while you were gone. Someone's got to say it. For now, anyway. There's right. no legal requirement to say it. <laughs> check. It's... Little do you know. Yeah, it's in our contracts. Oh. Just check. All right, uh, we're quick on time, so this is going to be like zip, zip, zip. Here we go. Uh, so let's move on to the first story. And Kimberly, you haven't been with us for a little while. It was a big story. I choo choo choose you. Well, thanks. So this past Saturday, early in the morning in the U.S., uh, the NASA's next lander that's going to Mars launched from California. It's called Insight, and it is a pretty gosh darn awesome mission. Uh, it's going to land on Mars, stationary lander, and it's going to probe the interior of Mars for the first time in about 40 years. Uh, it's This lander, it has a seismometer, it has a heat probe, and it has a really complex radio science system. Uh, and all of all these instruments are going to be essentially looking inwards at Mars, looking at the amount of heat that's flowing out of the planet, checking out the current levels of tectonic and seismic activities, checking out the rate of meteor impacts, measuring the size of the core and how all of these things uh, influence Mars's orbital evolution. Uh, and all of these sort of, they're, when you put it all together, uh, the scientists are hoping that they'll get a better idea of how Mars formed, how it evolved, and then use that to get a better idea of how rocky planets in general can form. Because uh, one of the things that we, there's there's so many of these questions about Earth, for example, our own habitable planet that we don't know. And they're really difficult to figure out what Earth was like in the beginning because Earth is always changing. Uh, on the surface and interior, there's just so much activity that it's essentially wiped out these early records of what Earth was like right after it formed. But Mars, which is you know a third of the size of Earth, it still underwent a lot of these early geologic processes, but then it shut down. Yeah. So if you can 
get a look inside Mars. It's essentially like getting a look back at what Earth was like right after it formed. And I heard an interview with one of the uh, the people on the team, I think the, the principal investigator, and he was saying that the seismometer that they're equipping on this spacecraft is going to be capable of, will essentially be capable of detecting movements back and forth about the size of an atom. Yeah, it is a, it's an incredibly sensitive seismometer, so much so that once it land, once this lander lands, it cannot move at all, not even to like rotate its camera around because any little vibration will essentially wipe out any sort of signal, but it's such an incredibly sensitive instrument. When they were calibrating it uh, at JPL, they could hear the waves crashing in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and the like person assigned to monitor the calibration test had to note down uh, every time they breathed or moved so that they could filter <laughs> that out of, and then of they the had data. And it, every time they wrote stuff down and they never, a, this is why I went over bottomless. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's basically black magic though, because the idea that you can use a single seismometer to make the kinds of measurements that they're claiming to be able to make, uh, basically seems impossible uh but they've proven that you can do it and that's yeah. amazing and the, and it's going to be able to potentially detect uh meteorite strikes that are going to happen within a certain distance of it they're going to be able to detect the the tidal uh effects of the moons as they pass overhead as the as the planet flexes they're going to be able to sort of what remove all that from the you know, what is the background volcanic activity within Mars, should it exist? Morgan, you were there for the launch. How, was it, what did you see? I didn't see a single thing. It what? was foggy as all get out. We gotten up at like three in the morning. We had kind of slept our way over to this landing strip where they collected everybody to watch. And then at 4.05, we saw nothing. <laughs> Uh, but we heard it, and we felt it, and that's about it. And we went back to bed, uh, satisfied that it was uh, well on its way. The first interplanetary launch from California. It sounds really super exciting. Yeah, a lot of people who were excited that it had launched, and a lot of people who said they probably wouldn't come back to do another launch uh, at Vandenberg, at least to watch, because I guess this basically happens all the time at least at night this uh seismometer that they're packing is it based on the latest and greatest seismometers that we use here on earth or is it pushing the envelope of seismometer technology from what I'm i understand sure. it's oh sorry go ahead Fraser. oh yeah from what i understand uh i just heard an interview like i said with the investigator and from what i understand like this is one of the advantages of this mission is that seismometer technology has been very well practiced and tested out here on here on earth so they're essentially sending a an earth-based an earth style seismometer to mars now one of the difficulties that they had was that they had to keep the seismometer in a perfect vacuum and one of the challenges they had was they found that their vacuum actually was a little bit leaking. It was sort of letting in a little bit of gas into the vacuum over a very long period of time. And so they had to go back and take the thing apart and rebuild the way the whole seismometer was all sealed up to remove even that because it would have caused the... That's the, what caused this 26-month delay. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the air or the Martian atmosphere going into this near-perfect vacuum would have caused uh, a pro you know would have caused it to not register correctly and then the the atmospheric resistance within the chamber would have made the the seismometer far less uh, accurate mm -hmm. very cool are we going to talk about the cube sets yeah. I was just about to say one of the other really awesome things that happened at the same time as the insight launch was the launch of the first pair of interplanetary cube sats uh, it's the Mars Cube One or Marco, and there have been so many Marco Polo jokes. No idea. <laughs> that's pretty um, much what they called it. That's pretty much, yeah, pretty much. Uh, but yeah, the uh, at the same time as the Insight launch, two CubeSats launched on their way to Mars called Marco. Um, it's the first essentially field test of CubeSats outside of Earth. 
and they're going to travel independently to Mars. Once they get there, if they get there intact, uh, <laughs> they're going to be integrated into the communications relay for InSight. Uh, it's sort of as a test of how we, if and how we can use CubeSats as part of like the interplanetary relay system. Uh, if they Just during the landing, though, they don't go into orbit. Right. They'll be cruising right by Mars. Right. Uh, if they don't work, InSight will still be able to communicate just fine. It's not an essential part of, of InSight, but it's a cool field test. But it's a it's a pretty exciting uh, thing that they added to this mission when you think about it, because up until this point, the missions are fairly large. But as you've got this bigger infrastructure, this communications infrastructure at Mars, you can send these smaller spacecraft that don't necessarily need to have a gigantic communications Mm -hmm. uh, dish on them. They just have to communicate with, say, Mars Odyssey or with the European Space Agency's spacecraft and then be able to send uh, and then relay that information back or Mars Reconnaissance. So the more infrastructure that gets to Mars, the more there can be these small CubeSats sent to answer very specific questions for a fraction of the price of the much larger spacecraft. Oh, yeah. And they just, you know, put it on the same rocket. Yeah. yeah, I think CubeSats could revolutionize the way in which we study, especially the interstellar system. Uh, you can think of sort of all sorts of cool, cool missions. Uh, like you think of MMS that uh, launched uh, a couple of years ago, four satellites in space that are measuring uh, magnetic reconnection between them. Those are four kind of big pricey satellites. You can imagine what if instead you had, you know, 50 or 100 CubeSats in uh, a constellation. You could get the sort of time and space resolution that's impossible right now just with a whole bunch of simple, single task um, CubeSats. Morgan, while I've got you on the screen, uh, let's talk about uh, hurricanes. Yeah, this is kind of, this is a really sort of quick gee whiz kind of thing. I think we all feel sometimes that, uh, you know, weather forecasters you know, aren't worth, you know, anything uh, that you, you go outside and it looks like it's going to be a sunny day and you look at your phone and it says it's raining. Um, but I think we're somewhat jaded in, in our view. And so every year, the National Hurricane Center uh, in Miami releases a report basically summarizing how well uh, hurricane prediction code did in predicting the paths of hurricanes in the past hurricane season. Uh, and this year we hit an amazing milestone uh, in which the five-day hurricane path predictions uh, were as accurate as the two-day hurricane path predictions were 20 years ago. Um, on average, five days out, we could predict within something like 150 miles where a hurricane was going to land. And, and that is what allowed us to react to some of these really damaging hurricanes and get people out of the way. For example, in the hurricane that struck Florida, uh, we knew that it was probably going to kind of cruise right up the center of Florida days before it happened. And people were able to ev evacuate in a much more orderly manner than if we had realized that just, say, 36 hours. Right. Two days isn't advance. enough time. Five days is. Yeah, and this is all down to the fact that com the supercomputers that these models are running on are 20,000 times faster than they were 20 years ago. Uh, and in fact, the best performing model uh, for predicting hurricanes in 2017 was the European climate model, which isn't trying to model hurricanes. It models the entire global weather <laughs> and just happens to give more accurate predictions of hurricanes than the sorts of codes that in the past we've used just to simulate sort of the Atlantic hurricane basin. Uh, and with taking in sort of all of these global climate effects, they can make predictions that are far beyond the scope of these more provincial models and suggest that as we get more powerful, we're gonna be able to make really remarkable weather predictions across all kinds of phenomena all over the, the globe. And before you think that uh, jumping from two days to five days over the course of 20 years doesn't sound that impressive, keep in mind that adding a day in, it, in terms of accuracy of forecast is literally an, an exponentially harder problem. And so being able to predict 
to that level of accuracy five days out with this insanely complex, insanely multi-scale, multi-physics kind of problem that we call the weather and climate is a huge advance. And like Morgan said, it's a combination of more powerful computers with more sophisticated simulation and modeling techniques to harness those computers to deliver more accurate results and more and better data all working together. Now, this baseline 20 years ago, they weren't even uh, trying to do four-day or five-day forecasts. So it's not like the five days today is you know a thousand times better than five days 20 years ago. They weren't even thinking of doing this. They had the two-day mm-hmm. forecast and they had a, a really flaky three-day forecast. And and today those the errors on a two-day forecast are small enough that you can basically call out the zip codes that the hurricane is going to pass through and the ones that it won't. Wow. Paul, dark matter, defend it. Well, there's this interesting article popped up, uh, once again, talking about Eric Verlin's uh, theory of emergent gravity and how it's simultaneously an interesting uh, extension slash replacement of general relativity in explaining gravity. Mm, is kind of sort of tuned to explain rotation curves in galaxies, which would eliminate the uh, dark matter problem or trying to need dark matter to explain the motions of stars and galaxies. Uh, And this article pointed out that there's also some very, very rough hints that this theory might also be able to explain dark energy in one fell swoop. And so the title of the article, it was like, you know, the case against dark matter. Maybe we don't need dark matter. Maybe we've just been wrong about gravity this whole entire time. And since we haven't observed the hypothesized dark matter particle, since we have no idea what dark energy is, it's kind of up for grabs. But this kind of calls back wait, what? in... This kind of calls back to what we were talking about last week, I think, which is sort of how do you evaluate uh, a physical theory? Because I think from a, a lot of perspectives, the whole dark matter and dark energy idea sort of feels like a kludge in the same way imagining that there was a vapor in space was a kludge to trying to understand how light propagated. It, it's something that it seems like we need, but we can't really say, and this is much more true of dark energy than dark matter, doesn't really, we can't really say what it is. And uh, here we have a theory that makes some similar predictions without needing those things. How do we evaluate when to start lending some some credence to it? Uh, uh, calling uh, dark matter and especially dark energy uh, on the same level as the ether theory is is one of my trigger words. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to push back on that just a, just a little bit. Dark energy is the name we give to the observed acceleration, accelerating expansion of the universe. This is an observed reality, a feature of our cosmos. We give it the cool name of dark energy. I will be the first one to say we have no clue what it is what's causing it, but it is a real thing that we see in nature. I'm being a little contrarian here. Okay, Okay. so Paul, so you mentioned that this theory is sort of tuned to explain galaxy rotation curves mm-hmm. as, a, as an alternate for dark matter. What about the other lines of evidence for dark matter, aside that's, from galaxy yeah, rotation? Yeah, that's, and that's where this model starts to run into trouble. And why dark matter as a weakly interacting massive particle always continues to survive despite decades of trying to overthrow it because dark matter as a substance, as a thing, as a material is able to explain so many different kinds of observations, not just galaxy rotation curves, but also the temperature of gas in motions of galaxies and galaxies clusters, the large scale distribution of matter, the the imprint on the cosmic microwave background, the presence of baryon acoustic oscillation, lensing, the, the whole shebang. Uh, whereas these models like emergent gravity that 
you know, have some free parameters you can play around. You, you still don't fully understand the structure of the theory and the consequences. And you tune it to something like rotation curves, you end up not being able to tune yourself to match, say, the cosmic microwave background or lensing measurements. And that's where these kinds of theories always run into trouble is in being able to explain the variety, the panoply right. of observations, of cosmic observations. Well, so for people who maybe don't understand, can you just give a, a quick explanation for what Verlind is saying? What is emergent gravity compared to, you know, regular Einsteinian regular gravity. gravity? Decaf gravity. Yeah. Uh, it's, I haven't yet found the way to, to very concisely and describe this in a very pithy, straightforward way. Well, every time you do this, you're just going to get more practice until you've oh, got that's the, true. that's true. Yeah. Um, it's akin to how, what we call the laws of thermodynamics actually arise from more fundamental microscopic interactions. They're an emergent property of something that's happening on much smaller scales. Verlinde's theory is that gravity is something that appears as a result of something more fundamental, something more microscopic, something deeper. It's not an intrinsic property. It's not an intrinsic property of a universe. Something else is an intrinsic property of intrinsic interaction. And then it leads to this macroscopic thing that we call gravity. His lead into that of why that's like not just laughed out of the seminar room is of all this, all the whole thing about black hole thermodynamics and the, this weird relationship between gravity and thermodynamics in the first place, um, which we 100% don't fully understand. Uh, but one of the possible avenues is emergent gravity. So what's your, what's your opinion? What's your final answer here? Final answer. Emergent gravity is interesting. I don't think, I personally don't think it's very compelling just because, you know, the dude's been working on it for like 20 years and doesn't, no other people have really seriously caught on to it. And there's probably a reason for that. Is it going to replace dark matter? Probably not. Even if we had lived in a universe with emergent gravity, we would still require dark matter in some form. Is it going to replace dark energy? Uh, no. But I think you could see with the tough, you know, we've been talking about the Large Hadron Collider and how people have been having a harder and harder time mm -hmm chasing down what these elusive dark matter particles are every experiment every detector hasn't been able to 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 turn them up and i think when someone like verlindy comes out and says here's this alternative theory that the math seems to work in this one situation and all i'm asking every you physicists to do is maybe give me a hand to try and explore hey you hey you string theorists who have a little time on your hands yeah you don't you don't seem busy anymore. you don't seem busy enough anymore why don't you join me over here and let's just try and explore the the possibility of this i mean it it it's gone from i think of course it's a particle to now people are starting to go they're they're almost like willing to give some of these more alternative ideas a second look because the particles are just so difficult have been so elusive so far right i think i think in the cosmological community it is still dark matter as a particle is still by far the leading contender it is in fact baked in at the level, uh, at the assumption level in things like cosmological simulations that we use to study and understand and make predictions about the universe. Uh, if it's 10 years from now, maybe even five years from now and no particle turns up in the entire parameter space of what the particle could be is simply eliminated and ruled out, then we've got to do some serious soul searching about if we are going to insist it's a particle, how come we're not seeing it? And then we've got some issues. But until then, there's always been alternative theories. Mond has modified Newtonian dynamics, has always been around. Tevis has been around for a long time. Uh, emergent gravity has been around for a long time. But they're not the simplest explanation of all the observational data. And so until then, we won't move in that direction. Uh, 
Well, and I, I have one last thing before we move on, which is just, I mean, I think we, you know, researchers have been searching for a particle that somehow communicates gravity, right? This idea of the graviton, which would violate the existing laws of physics as we understand them, should it be found. But we don't need to have a particle to say gravity is a thing. And, just, and you know, isn't it possible to just go, we've gotten to dark matter is just something that's in the universe and we don't, we, like it, it doesn't feel to me or same thing with dark energy, like with all of these, they don't, like, why do we need them to be a thing beyond them just being some attribute of the universe that we can map and, and get better and better readings of and measurements of? Why do we feel like we have to f corner it and find it as a, as a concrete thing as opposed to, I don't know, like with gravity, like no one says like, where can you chase down how the gravity is being communicated? I, I don't know if I'm making any sense here. I think you're, you're, no, I think you're making sense. And this is the difference between phenomenology and physics. So if all we were interested in doing was cataloging the various interactions and properties of those interactions and measuring them very well, and just writing them down in a table, in a book, in a spreadsheet and calling it a day, that's fine but it doesn't enable us to make predictions it does enable it doesn't enable us to understand at a deeper level what is going on in order to do that we need to bring in mathematical models that can explain the data so as an analogy we could just very very accurately calculate day by day the positions of the orbits of the planets if we do that, we'll never be able to make a robust prediction of where those planets will be tomorrow unless we incorporate a mathematical model of their motions. Right. And I guess that's the thing is that we don't have even just a mathematical model that that is bulletproof for dark matter yet. Yeah, we, we have we definitely have a mathematical model. We have a, a candidate, a set of candidate particles with predicted properties that we are looking for. Uh, dark energy is still at that phenomenology stage where we're just trying to measure it. We don't have we don't have a physics for dark energy yet. All right, just a few more minutes left. I got a couple of things I want to get through. One, and I'm just going to give you the quick version of this, which is a really interesting story uh, from uh, Rutgers University that they found that the Venus and Jupiter interact with Earth's orbit so that they change the orbit every 405,000 years and it has an impact on the climate. So sometimes the orbit of the Earth is actually very circular and other times it's more elongated and it appears to be this interaction between Oh, it these changes planets. our ellipticity. Yeah, so it goes from nearly circular to to what is it? 5%. Um and this is so accurate that they can now map this uh, and they've been able to map this against some of the field reversals of the magnetic field to get a better sort of measuring stick for being able to determine various events and things that have happened in the past. And it's it's sort of an amazing thing that it happens every 405,000 years in the way that the planets will just sort of line themselves so up. So is the, is the resonance entirely responsible for our change in eccentricity or does it just play a role? No, it's it's it causes the eccentricity. Yeah, so it's an, it it wow. goes back and forth from nearly circular to uh to a five percent eccentricity. Yeah, I think yeah. five around five percent. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and that seems to be uh, which is a lot. Yeah, and that seems to be tied directly with the interactions between Jupiter and Venus. And I've actually seen sort of estimates that, for example, Jupiter could still throw mercury out of the solar system at, mm -hmm. at almost any time because of there's these... a uh what is it i forget the exact numbers i think there's a 10 percent chance within the next five billion years that mercury will get chaotically ejected and this Jeez. is in addition to the milankovitch you know arjun saying in the chat this is in addition to the milankovitch cycle this is in addition mm -hmm. to the, the way the earth is is uh processing at its poles it's just another cycle that seems to happen over the course of of sort of the history of the planet which is just amazing so uh morgan one last story about commercial crew and then we'll wrap it up yeah i was 
on the show in January talking about how NASA had reported that Boeing and SpaceX were behind schedule for launching astronauts to the space station, uh, and that the new timeline was Boeing launching the first commercial crew in November of this year and SpaceX in December. Uh, and in a report this week from the Government Accountability Office, we found out that those numbers are probably pretty ambitious what? and more believable right now is maybe SpaceX in December of next year and Boeing February 2020. Oh. Wait, and you mean apparently launches are behind schedule? Yeah, what? shocker, right? Uh, apparently NASA has specific issues with each com company's project. And then the Falcon 9 side of things, NASA is frustrated by how much they're tinkering with it and don't want to sort of rate it for humans until they stop messing with it. And they've so actually jacked tomorrow... up the price too. I don't know if you've seen, they're paying about 50% oh, yeah. more for the next run of, of non-commercial, like just the cargo, commercial cargo, which is, you know, so their NASA prices is... are getting quite in line with what's happening with Orbital ATK. Yeah, NASA is going to make them launch the Block 5 uh, seven times without making any changes before they'll human rate it. And compare that with one launch of the SLS before it'll be human rated or zero launches of the space shuttle. Uh, and they clearly don't like the fact that SpaceX iterates in, in the way they do. Uh, and with Boeing, there's problems with the capsule, the Starliner capsule. Uh, one problem is that simulations show that if it would need to abort and blast off of the rocket, it tends to tumble violently when doing that, which is obviously not oh, thank a you. good way to abort. Uh, and then also returning from space, they're worried that the heat shield at the top of the capsule that protects the parachute might damage the parachute as it's deployed. And obviously that would be a pretty negative outcome too. Uh, and so these different sort of problems add up to what looks to be uh, more than a year's delay uh, on top of the delay that was just announced four months ago to actually taking advantage of U.S. companies launching astronauts to the space station. Turns out space is difficult. That's what they say. Yep. All right. Well, now it's time for our interview. Okay, well, let's wrap things up. Uh, before we do, I didn't get a chance to thank, of course, our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is, of course, our produce, our executive producers, the community that joins us every week to do this show. You can join them. Go to wshcrew.space. They provide the chat that's down at the bottom of the screen. But really, they're the ones who book the guests. They do a lot of the outreach with the authors and the folks at NASA and the astronauts. So if you want to be an executive producer of the Weekly Space Hangout, come join. Go to wshcrew.space. Thanks, as always, everyone. We really appreciate it. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, and even if you're not, take a second and give this a rating on whatever podcasting service you currently enjoy. It means a ton to us and helps more people find the show and helps make sure we get renewed every year by our executive producers <laughs> at wshcrew.space. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's find out uh, what people are working on. Morgan, what, what do you got happening? I've been thinking a lot this week about climate change because April was the first month in history that we had more than 410 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere every day of the month. And it's possible that that will never go below that level continuously for a month for the rest of our lives. And so we're sort of smashing through barriers every day, it seems. And so I've been thinking a lot about how to talk about climate change in a way that doesn't just sort of make us all panic and shut down. <laughs> Perhaps in some form of a graph or a data visualization. One might imagine. Yeah. Kimberly, what are you working on? Uh, so this week's been a rather fun week for me. I spent a lot of the time actually looking at cakes and cookies because this uh, mm. the 
geological you have my society. attention. Yeah. <laughs> the Geological Society of London is wrapping up their annual Geo Bake Off, where they challenge all of their members to create baked goods that represent geologic processes and regions of the world and the cosmos. And this this year's theme was uh, geology, resources, and and areas in space and TV and literary references. So there were things like Star Wars landscapes and the vast English countrysides that you see in movies. And I think they also challenged the, uh, their bakers to recreate the tunnels in Stranger Things. Uh, so it was a Can rather I fun week judge? for me to just <laughs> see all these amazing confectionery creations that I want to recreate. <laughs> so so uh, Paul wants to know how he can be a judge. Maybe move to London. Okay. Ah. Uh, okay. Or PO take Box three three two two Columbus Ohio four three two one zero. Yeah. Send, send your win. cakes to winners. Paul. And cheese, you can always send me cheese and in lieu cheese. of donations and. Well, oh, there were there were some savory baked goods as well, so I'm sure a lot of them had cheese. Quiches. All for you. There was a cheesecake. Scones, cheesecake. Oh my. Mm, Come yeah, on. Yeah, that's good stuff. Morgan, your uh, oh sorry, Paul. What do you? What have you got going on? <laughs> so uh, tomorrow, space radio, four o'clock. Eastern, normal time, we're doing a normal episode. Then at 4.30, the most amazing thing is going to happen. Sky from of Twitch.tv fame, science communicator extraordinaire, is coming on to Space Radio to co-host. We are testing some new gear where we can incorporate a guest into the live stream with video, and you can call up on the phone to ask your questions to both me and to Sky. We think we have all the pieces together. We're testing it tomorrow. 4.30 p.m. Eastern on Space Radio, and it will be a real episode that will go out on the air as a podcast, and it's going to be a hot mess, and it's going to be lots of fun. <laughs> and, of course, you're on Sky Show every week on Tuesdays, right? Every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, I join her live stream, and uh, we talk about cheese, honestly, and then also a lot of space. Yeah, equal parts. I've, I've watched a couple of them. 50-50. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... Now, we, you may have heard that uh, Dr. Alan Stern and Dr. David Grinspoon, uh, also known as Dr. Funky Spoon, uh, they've both been guests, of course, on the Weekly Space Hangout. They just released a new book all about New Horizons and seeing Pluto for the first time. And unfortunately, our schedule is totally filled up for the Weekly Space Hangout to the end of the season. But I'm going to have them on my channel on Monday at 5 o'clock for the open space conversations that I've been doing. So... Come over and join us on Monday, 5 p.m. Pacific time, and we will uh, be taking questions from people who are watching, and we'll be talking about New Horizons and what's coming up next and all that. So, so check that out. All right, time to wrap things up. As always, thank you, everybody, for watching us live. Thanks to my co-host, our special guest. There's everybody on the screen, and we will see you all next week.